In this video, we're going to be taking a look at the RetroX front end and launcher on the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus. If you hate fiddling around with RetroArch, then RetroX is definitely something you should be considering. So let's dive in. RetroX isn't available from the Play Store, so on your Retroid Pocket 2 Plus, start up your browser and go to RetroX.tv. RetroX is not a free app, but it's certainly not expensive and it's definitely worth the money as far as I'm concerned. There is a five day completely unrestricted free trial and I suggest that you give that a go to try it out first. So the first thing to do is to click the try now button. That takes you to the download page. So scroll down and hit the download button. Obviously you're going to need to grant the permissions that it asks for. Just work your way through all of those, including saying yes to allowing the install. Once it's installed, click on the open button. Now, as easy as RetroX is for getting your games up and running really quickly, there is one downside to it. And you'll have to decide whether or not this is a showstopper for you. And that is that it needs an internet connection. This is partly an anti-piracy thing and partly because it's regularly updating things to provide you with the best performance and latest changes. So one of the first things you're going to see is a message flash up saying that it is checking your internet connection. I bought a lifetime membership so I'm going to log in with that account. You can have six devices active at any point in time. And if you're about to exceed that, you'll get this message asking you to deactivate one so that your Retroid Pocket 2 Plus can be activated. It's a simple process and you can always reactivate the old device later if you want. One of the nice things about RetroX is that it saves your save states in the cloud. So because I've just activated this device, it's downloading all my save states so I can continue where I left off from whatever device I was using last. And you can see what I mean about the auto updates. Now that RetroX is installed, the next thing to do is to start adding your game systems. And again, this is made incredibly easy. Click the Add Games Now button, and if you have your games organized by System Folder, then just click on the Add Folder for One System option. Just scroll down the list and pick the system you're wanting to add. I'm going to start with Dreamcast. My ROMs are stored on the microSD card, so I'll choose that. Navigate down to the Retro Games folder where I keep all the Retro Games stuff. I'll then choose Games and then Dreamcast. One of the things I like about RetroX is that it tells you the file formats it can work with and whether they can be in compressed files such as RAR, ZIP or 7-ZIP. You don't have to go hunting around trying to find out this sort of thing. So now that I'm in the Dreamcast folder, I'll choose select this folder. A pop-up will show asking if I want to scan the folder now. And obviously the answer is yes. I want to scan now. Scanning is normally very quick and we're dropped back at the manage games pop-up. At this point, it's really just rinse and repeat. Choose the system you want to import, say where the folder is that contains your games, scan, and that's it. Just keep doing this for each system you want to import. When you're finished, you can click on the home icon at the top right of the screen to take you back to the home page. To the left of that is the icon to add another game or system. And to the left of that is the icon to show your different systems, with the icon on the far left being the search icon. So if I click on the systems icon, you can see it show a grid of all the systems it is capable of playing, not just the ones I've loaded games for, and while it's nice to see what it's capable of, in day-to-day -day use that can get a little confusing, trying to remember which are populated and which are not. So I'm going to hit the back button, select the hamburger icon in the top left, and choose the settings. From there, if I select the display and audio settings, you'll see there is an option in there to include systems without games in the selector screen. So if you only want to see the systems you have actually populated, then change that to a no. And as you can see, I'm now down to just the six systems I populated. So what else can RetroX do? Let's take another quick look at the settings. 
And I'll touch on some of the main things you probably need to be aware of. Gamepad settings can be configured very easily should you want to change anything. And there's a host of options in there, such as showing or hiding the on-screen controls and swapping A and B buttons if you want. Pretty much everything you would want to do to customize the gamepad. Under the display and audio settings, you also have a lot of options, but most aren't particularly relevant for the Retro Pocket 2 Plus. However, one that I'd recommend you play with is the user interface and themes. There isn't a massive choice, but what there is, is good. Although I found the text on some of them a little bit difficult to read on the Retroid's tiny screen. Still within the display and audio settings, selecting advanced options allows you to switch the display of FPS on or off, as well as turn on or off the message that pops up saying a controller is connected. I think it's useful when connecting external controllers, but for something with a controller built in, like the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus, it can get a bit annoying after a while. I've created a separate video which shows gameplay using RetroX, and you'll see what I mean when you watch that video. There are plenty of other options for you to explore, but for now, if you want to see how gameplay is under RetroX, then click on that video. It's displayed on the screen right now and will take you through how RetroX performs so you can see for yourself. Or you can check out how RetroX stacks up against Lemuroid, which is another easy to set up front end for the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus.